Welcome back, folks. This is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here at WAUK 540 AM, 92.7 or 101 FM every Monday night from 7 to 8 PM. We've been talking about democracy in Wisconsin, its future, and where we're at. It is another beautiful fall night. Unfortunately, it's three weeks in a row that we have a uh, Packer hangover. Uh, They just can't seem to score. But I am honored to have back Sarah Rodriguez, the candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing, I am doing great. Although I agree with your Packers assessment, that was a very difficult, difficult game to watch. Uh, it's, it's been a deep depression here. You know, we got my, my mother, my wife, my grandkids, everybody in Packer gear and all fired up. And there it was. But hey, you're uh, 15 days away from a huge election. Yeah, November 8th, right? We hope everybody's registered and get out to vote. So tell tell our listeners, where's the campaign for candidate for lieutenant governor and the governorship with Tony Evers? What's going on? And, uh, you know, what are people saying? Well, you know, we have been across the whole state, both of us, sometimes together, sometimes separately. Uh, But we are really excited because we're going to be doing a bus tour all across the state uh, with myself, Governor Evers, uh, Josh, Attorney General Josh Call. And uh, it's going to be starting on Thursday for about 10 days. We're going to be across the state meeting people, talking to people, getting them excited about voting on November 8th or making sure that they can go early. Early voting starts tomorrow for most municipalities. We just want to make sure that everybody gets out there, have their voices heard. This is going to be a critical election on November 8th of where we're going to go as a state. And you have to make sure you are voting this November 8th. So that tees it up. Why vote for Sarah Rodriguez, and why reelect Tony Evers? It's all so, yours. Yeah. So Governor Evers has done really amazing things for the state. He has been so successful, even within difficult times. And I'm not sure that your listeners know this, but he has put over a billion dollars in small businesses and family farms, over a million and a half dollars in job training programs and apprenticeships. We have the lowest unemployment rate we have ever had in Wisconsin, ever. And the most people working, the economy is strong, and that is because of Governor Evers' policies. He has moved our public school system from 18th in the country to 8th. And that's even with working with a very difficult assembly, Republican-led assembly and Senate, who did not want to put additional funding into the school systems and continue to drag their heels on putting additional funding into the public school systems. And so he has worked really hard to move Wisconsin forward. And all of that is going to be on the line this November. So, you know, I've I've been just listening. There there have been attacks made against Governor Evers and against... um, uh, not so much you, but Governor Evers, on, on the whole issue of how do we handle crime and where it's at. So, what's what's your response to you know what I what I call pretty unsubstantiated allegations? But it's out there. What do you say? Right. So I, I, I would encourage people to look at what uh, the Journal Sentinel put out there for PolitiFact. They called a lot of these ads pants on fire lies. And so here's here's the thing. Uh, Governor Evers has been wanting to help municipalities with what they want to do for crime and safety within their communities. So one of the things that Governor Evers has wanted to do was to increase shared 
revenue for these communities. Now, what shared revenue is, is we all pay taxes in our communities. That goes up to the state government. The state government pays for that state level services. And then we share that revenue back to the municipalities. And that has really remained flat or even less over the past several years, even though Governor Evers has put in his budget every year to increase those shared revenues back to the communities. And those communities can use that shared revenue to add more police officers if they'd like to. They can do uh, violence prevention programs within their communities. They could add different services that would address, you know, things like job search and poverty, uh, address poverty within the communities that can be root causes of crime. And, and the Republicans have refused to work with Governor Evers to add these dollars back into communities. That's how you really address crime it, with, and safety within communities. You make sure they have the resources to add the police officers and the fire uh, men and women that they need for their communities. That's what the Democrats are fighting for. That's why we need another four years of Governor Evers. So what do you hear? You've been out there campaigning. 24 seven for quite a while. What are folks saying out there? You know, I, I live in Waukesha County and I, I know I've said that before, but I, I, and I have lived, I've grown up here. I grew up, went to Brookfield East high school. And what I am hearing out there is the, the folks who have normally voted for Republicans in the past have realized how radical and out of touch those policies are, the current Republican Party. It is not the Republican Party of my mother who voted Republican much of her life. She no longer votes for the Republican Party because she no longer agrees with the policies that they're putting forward. Something that we've talked about quite a bit on your show is that 1849 cruel and archaic abortion ban that we have here in Wisconsin that has no exceptions, even for rape or incest. I'm a nurse. I have a lot of friends who are physicians and obst uh, obstetricians and gynecologists. There are real consequences to this law. And uh, uh, Michaels has said, the, the Republican governor candidate Michaels has said that he is in full agreement with the law and would continue to have that be the law of the land in Wisconsin, while Governor Evers is actually in the court system trying to overturn that law so we can have safe, effective, easily accessible reproductive care for folks here in Wisconsin. You know, so as you've traveled across the state, how have women been responding to that, you know, what their their new life without their right to their reproductive, you know, decisions and facing a law that was passed before women even had a right to vote? What are people saying about that? Well, there, a lot of women have come up to me uh, and talked about some really, really scary stories that they've had. There was, I was in Eau Claire and one woman came up to me who had a wanted pregnancy and her um, water broke at 16 weeks. This was two days after Roe versus Wade was uh, overturned and she had to wait for her physician to be able to consult legal services before she could get the therapeutic abortion that she needed to quite literally save her life. When you have a uh, water breaking at 16 weeks, that's not a viable pregnancy. It's actually very, very dangerous for the pregnant woman to be able to continue with that pregnancy. They risk sepsis, they risk ICU stays, they risk death they risk not being ha be able to have children in their future. And so those are real people's stories, real people's lives that have been affected here. And I continue to hear stories like that all across the state of what's happened after Dobbs, um, the decision came on and overturned Roe versus Wade. You know, what, what do you see in terms of younger voters? What kind of response, you know, I've read some newspaper articles and there's like a concern that young folks aren't interested or, you know, active, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but what do you, what's your sense being out there day to day with, with the voters? 
Well, I, I think we've always struggled to be able to have um, younger folks vote. It's been a difficult for them to vote. Um, you know, they've they've had challenges with that. But uh, what I'm hearing out there on the college campuses, what I'm hearing out there in with folks who are high school seniors turning 18, they are excited to get into that voting booth and make their voices heard. And what I keep telling folks, and maybe there's some younger people who are listening, is that the policies we enact today they're the they're the ones that are going to be affected by these policies that they would create that we create today. So they need to make sure that they are voting and having their voices heard so they can choose the pathway for Wisconsin. And in, in terms of the campaign, what do you and my governor Tony Evers have to say to young people in terms of why the two of you? So the two the two of us are really going to focus on the infrastructure and the economy in Wisconsin so that we can make sure that young people stay. We have an outflux of people in Wisconsin today. Kids are leaving. Young adults are leaving the state. We want them to stay. We want them to to. Um, you know, create businesses here. We want them to go to school here. We want them to contribute to the economy. So Governor Evers and I are going to focus on things that are important to the folks here, which is making sure we have a world-class university system, making sure folks can open up small businesses all across the state and giving them support for that. Uh, w making sure that young people are able to make decisions about their bodies when and if they want to have children. This is really, really important for folks across the state. And we want to move Wisconsin forward. We don't want to go backwards all the way to 1849. That's why we want to make sure that um, young people are going to be voting for uh, Governor Evers and I this November. So we have... Uh... About 30 seconds left before the break, Sarah. I know that um, before we jumped on, you had mentioned that President Barack Obama is going to be here. Are you planning on seeing him? And what's that he rally going to do? He is. I am so excited. Yeah, President Obama is going to be here on Saturday. I have never met him before, and I am so excited to meet him. He is just a hero of mine. And yes, I am going to be there with him during the rally that he's there. And uh, that I just really hope that as many people as possible can come and see him. And let's get excited and make sure we're voting this November 8th. Sarah Rodriguez, candidate for lieutenant governor. Thank you so much, folks. We'll be back on the other side of the break with a surprise guest. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. You're good. No, you're good. So I'm going to ask you that same. All right. Way. Hello, folks. This is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere show. We are back. And folks, we have a very, very special guest, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. My Congresswoman, welcome to the show, Congressman. Yeah, How are you? I'm doing great. I was just curious as to why you called it the Paul Revere show. Well, I tell you, you know, the, the Paul Revere show is named this way because the, the poem that created, that we all know, the, the famous ride, that poem was written right as the South seceded, and the poem was written to rally the troops to fight slavery and fight for democracy, and so I named the show, the Paul Revere show, because I felt that we are in Wisconsin and de our democracy was under attack. And the uh, there are some very, very bad white supremacists that are also moving. So I thought it was the time to get on the air and talk about democracy. And I'm so glad you could join us tonight. To, so tell us what do you see at this election on November 8th, nationally and in the state? Well, first of all, you know, I uh, am very uplifted. You know, Mark, thank you for inviting me to the Paul Revere show. It just so happens, a little factoid, 
my birthday is April 18th. Of course, that's 1951, so, you know, 175 or 76 years later. But, you know, I really take on the spirit of Paul Revere at this point and sending out the battle cry for votes to um, all of our voters uh, and to ask them, first of all, to, ju to just believe and to not surrender. You know, I'm thinking of that book, that little teeny weeny book written by, what's his name, Tim Schneider, called On Tyranny. I mean, it's a little thin little book. And I mean, the first chapter says, you know, don't surrender ahead of time. I mean, and to, to you know, when we look at the polls for our statewide elections, they are within the margin of error and when you see that there are candidates ahead of other candidates, it's only because they are um, they are looking at a model with an assumption that people in Milwaukee, African Americans in particular, won't show up. And so, when you you know, if if you know the 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 error in the polling, maybe is that they're counting people out in terms of voters. And so that's that's why I'm making that rallying cry when people say, oh, you know, you know, so-and-so is six points behind. No, that's a model based on their assumptions about the behavior of voters. It's a midterm. So there are perfectly decent people, Mark, you know, who pay their bills and don't beat their children, go to work every day. <laughs> who won't vote because the president is not on the ballot. So let me ask you this. You know, a lot of you hear a lot in the press about President Biden not coming across for Americans. Can you just in a minute or two remind all of us what you and President Biden have been able to do for the people in Washington? Oh, you sound like Janet Jackson. You know, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> well, I mean, really, you know, in a nutshell, no legislation this broadly has been passed for, you know, climate and for health care uh, and for inflation reduction that since 1965, since the Lyndon Baines Johnson Great Society. Now, I'm old enough to remember that era, but that was when Social Security was created. I mean, I'm sorry, Medicare was created through the Social Security Act. Medicare, uh, 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 Medicaid, those were the golden days of reaching out and caring about people. And, you know, you know we expanded so-called Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And, I mean, there were 10 million more people who are eligible and the premiums are getting more and more affordable. And they're not these skeletal <laughs> plans that people uh, uh, scam people out of. And then when they get to the emergency room, nothing is covered. So healthcare, um, you know, just this latest stuff that, that Biden has done. I mean, he finally, after a stranglehold of a couple of decades, a generation, been able to get, be able to negotiate with big pharma to cap the cost of insulin uh, on seniors at $35 a month. You know, there are people out there listening, Mark, who know if they've got diabetics in that family, that care and stuff can be $400 a month. And you, you got to have insulin when you have type 2 diabetes or, or type one, but certainly type two diabetes. You know, I mean, that was like huge. The, the, the biggest investment in the world ever and in the United States on clean energy. And that might sound very abstract to people, Mark, but I want people to think back to when they couldn't dream of having a microwave or, or having a, a flat screen TV because they were so expensive. Well, this is what we're going to do with the transformation away from fossil fuels. You know, we're going to, it's going to be as affordable and more affordable to have clean energy as with fossil fuels. 
And think of, it'll create 900,000 jobs a year to put in these, you know, electric pumps. and uh, Congressman Moore, thank you so much. I got to go to a break. I'm hoping you can stick around on the other side and we can talk a few more minutes. All right. All right, folks, this is Attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show, WAUK 540 AM. Congressman Gwen Moore is our guest, and we will be back with more on the other side of the break. Welcome back, folks. This is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here every Monday night from 7 to 8 on WAUK, 540 AM. The Shaw, folks, 101 or 92.7 FM. I am uh, very honored to have Congresswoman Gwen Moore as our guest for this uh, next half hour. And uh, we were talking a little bit about the the campaign before the break, Congresswoman Moore. So what's the get out the vote look like? What's you know, what's the what's the feel on the streets? Well, I I, I do think that we really do have to create the the kind of excitement that we want. I honestly think that uh, President Obama's visit is going to really energize people and and he's going to deliver a message. You know, you know, I think it's important to get you'll you'll see people and people will get the energy they need. One of the questions that people ask is, you know, can we win? And. It's frightening to think that people are even answering that question because they that, that means they don't really know their power. You know, I mean, you, you know, if you're, you know, a 21 year old person out there, you're the most terrifying thing in the world (laughs) to to the status quo, (laughs) eligible to vote, uh, because you have a lot of power between October 25th and November 8th, you know, to elect and unelect people who aren't looking out for you. And I think, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to, to 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 realize the pain that people have been in, Mark. It's been a terrible couple of years. This pandemic, it's taken our loved ones away. But I've had relatives die as of others, people with long COVID, uh, people uh, undiagnosed diseases that went out of control because they couldn't get a doctor's appointment, food insecurity. <laughs> Nobody can afford housing. I really get that. But I, I just really want to remind people, you know, who did something to intervene in your situation? You know, getting those unemployment checks extended, those child tax credits to get you through when the schools. I just want people to remember that. Uh, and you know, it's, it's like that song, Janet Jackson said, what have you done for me lately? Well, yeah. And who is it? Just stop and think, do a gut check. Who is it that voted against this stuff every step of the way? Who is it that's out there now talking about inflation and they blame inflation on you? You out there who needed that unemployment check to survive needed you you felt like it was manna from heaven when you got that three hundred dollar a month child tax credit and they're blaming you they're not blaming uh uh big corporations who by the way during this horrible two years have had record breaking profits they have never seen ever their percentages in profits and we've given tax breaks to them but that spending and those shareholders that have bought back share now that's not causing inflation let them tell it it's just you 
your unemployment check that you got. I mean, how dare them? You know, keeping you know, people from becoming unhoused. Uh, no, uh, uh, that you know, they can't just wrap a bow around our misery and say, on top of you know, and and, and by the way, we're going to suppress your votes, deny you the right to vote, do everything we can to prevent you from voting. We're going to discourage you with our commercials telling you and our polls telling you we're betting that you're not going to vote. Uh, and, and, and it's really, this is not the time to give up. It's not the time to give in and it's not the time to get out. That's a quote from, from the late, great John Lewis. This is not the time to surrender. Uh, our democracy is at stake. And I'm going to shut up, Mark. No, no, no. I, you know, people, the, my listeners want to hear from you, not me. But, you know, I think you you hit on something that's really profoundly true that I've, um, you know, paid more and more attention to the older I've gotten is this idea of our democracy you know, so many people, and I know I've had friends and there have been times in my life, you just go in day in, day out, and you think, you know, everything is just going to take care of itself, right? You just, I don't need to show up because, you know, the, the people are there and they're going to take care of our democracy. And, you know, but you talk about voting rights and, I, you know, my personal story <laughs> recently, I'm on the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Oh my God, you're a saint. No, but you know, but here's here's the story, right? I served with, you know, there's three Republicans and three Democrats, you know, three each commissioners. There is a sheriff that wanted to put five of us in <laughs> jail for letting for letting people seniors vote in the middle of the pandemic. And the I never dreamt in my lifetime that there would be Republicans that would want to put people from an agency in jail for letting seniors vote in a pandemic, right? I mean, everybody has a constitutional right to vote. The only way these folks in the nursing homes could vote is if you could get them an absentee ballot that could get back in time to be counted. And we well, all vote, right? Yeah. The right. initial vote was 6-0, let's do it. And everybody wanted the seniors to vote. And then all of a sudden they want to put us in jail for it. And not only that, Dean Knutson <laughs> was a Republican, they ran him off the elections commission. They wouldn't let him serve. You know, Senator Ron Johnson, they're out there orchestrated his, you know, getting him off. And they, they threw him off, ran him out of town simply because he said he had the audacity to say this. Donald Trump lost the election. I'm a conservative, but I have to have the integrity to tell the public that we lost and they ran him out of town. Now, I don't think I didn't think this could ever happen. And your point on why it's so important to vote and participate is crucial, right? Yep. Well, we're the Paul Revere's for this time. And, you know, and here's the thing. It, it doesn't go away. I mean, it's like my leaky roof. You know, I just thought, well, maybe it just won't get wet the next time. It, you know, it, eventually you have to you have to do something. And, you know, I just want people to take that last. I don't, you know, I remember what Reverend Jesse Jackson says, you know, Election Day is Dignity Day. You know, it 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 is it's it's a way to express your opinion in a decent, orderly, democratic way. You do not have to take, uh, you know, flag poles and Confederate flags and 3,000 people and break into the Capitol and kill police officers. And, uh, you know, you don't have to do that. Just go vote. And they've made it harder for you to vote 
because it is that essential. Now, like I said, Mark, you know, we're talking to a large swath of people who are non-voters in midterms because, you know, it's not that difficult to get people at the polls when there's a president on the ballot. So we're really, like I said, we're talking to basically very decent people. They keep their lawns nice and neat, their cars vacuumed and clean. You know, we're not talking to to to, to people who are are are, are you know uh, uh, slackers in any way. But it's so it's important for people to understand that this these midterm elections set the stage for those presidential elections. And, 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 and I'll tell you what's on online. You know, I mean, honestly, we couldn't get voting rights across. I could tell you all the good stuff that we did, and I brought some of that up earlier in the program. But some of the stuff that we didn't get done is securing voting rights, which is one of the reasons why, just like your story, you, you were on your way to jail, Mark. <laughs> for trying to get disabled people <laughs> some accommodation to, to vote. It's, it's absurd. And just recently, there was a court hearing where disabled people uh, were given some sort of relief, uh, a lawsuit that they had regarding the new rules that, you know, you, everybody's got to present their own absentee ballot themselves and in person. Um, um, and I think I don't have to guess why the Republicans are doing that. I mean, they have uh, made themselves a, a party uh, that is mostly white uh, and, you know, older people with money. Uh, and they're holding on to they got a lot of stake in the game. They don't want climate change because because, you know, somebody like Ron Johnson says, oh, my God, it, it, he, he says, we can't do anything about climate change. And that's that's what big oil and big lobbyists, I mean, that that must bring a lot of cash in for him to have that position. You know, he can't do anything simple things like background checks and tightening up those kinds of he can't do any of that. Vote for it. Uh, because you know, where he gets his his support. One of the reasons, you know, I know that th these Democrats, this cycle, are talking a lot about abortion. And I mean, I'm a raging granny when it comes to this this topic. And it, it's because it's, it's, it's a health care issue, life and death involved, but it's also an economic issue. It, and especially what an insult. For Republicans to say that when they get in office, they're going to put a nationwide ban on abortion when the very stuff that all the trillions of dollars we put through to pay down the deficit and improve health care and cap the pharma costs on seniors and, 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 and start a, a real investment in climate change, creating jobs with the infrastructure bill, uh, fixing bridges and airports, all that. What couldn't we get done? The very things that women need that were in these packages. Child care. So that women are not paying 30, 40 percent of their income to have decent health uh, child care. Pre-K. The science is in, uh, Mark. You, you, kids need to go to school before they're five. Brain development. Uh, occurs a lot earlier than that. And we're missing that by not funding pre-K. Oh, no. People like Ron Johnson can't, can't, you don't want to pay for that. What about the deficit? And that's actually an investment. You know, you know child care is, when we, child care is, is, is a woman's, a mother's issue. It's a family issue, but it inhibits primarily women from being able to participate in the workforce. And of course, these are the kinds of things that couldn't be funded. Paid family leave. And if, 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 if you're a woman out there, you know, it's not just your body autonomy. It's your mental autonomy, your social autonomy. It's your health autonomy. It's everything. It's everything. And I say this as a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. 
women need the right to have an abortion included in the right to have health care, period. You know, maternal mortality in Wisconsin rivals third world maternal mortality. Congressman, woman, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, my Congresswoman, we will be right back after the break as we listen to my Congresswoman speak truth to power. This is the Paul Revere Show. Mark Thompson will be right back. Attorney Mark Thompson. This is the show. I am delighted to have Congresswoman Gwen Moore, my Congresswoman, with me tonight. Hello again, Congresswoman. Hi, good. Glad to be back with you. You know, we are uh, now 15 days from an election, and you were reminding us of what is at stake nationally in this race in terms of the issues that uh, the Trump megas Republicans have stopped people from voting on, right? No voting rights acts. Right. Right. No, no, no George Floyd justice act. And you know, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, They wouldn't pass the inflation reduction act. It's really interesting. They're campaigning on crime. Uh, And Joe Biden has done so much uh, in providing law enforcement money. Tony Evers has here in the state uh, actually increased the numbers of police. And what they're basically doing is outrageous. They're blaming Black Lives Matter for crime. You know, all of the when George Floyd passed, there were millions, hundreds of millions of people in the world who saw it and responded. People were brought together globally like they had never been together for a long time on a single subject of police brutality. Uh, And, you know, some opportunists, people who broke windows or committed crimes, not at all related to legal proper protests, you know, they are, are, are saying that that is equivalent to what happened at the Capitol. You know, those I haven't seen one march anywhere, you know, trying to uh, honor the thugs at a, at a legitimate Black Lives Matter rally of people who decided that that was an opportunity, you know, to loot or something, you know, and 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 and, and no movement wants people like that to obscure their purposes. But I mean, what happened January 6th? I mean, I was in D.C. that day. I mean, you know, it it just outrages me that Johnson says that was nothing. And that was not. You've heard your audience has heard how many weapons they had in stock in Virginia. People avoiding the megatometers uh, so that they could keep weapons. The president you know, urging uh, the security to let his people through with the weapons. And he, and he, and he said that they were just basically <clears throat> people he could relate to, people that he wasn't afraid of, unlike Black Lives Matter. <laughs> you know, I, I think this is really important, what you just said, Congresswoman. You know, today, if I, if I saw the, the news right, Derek Chauvin, he pleaded, pleaded guilty to federal charges that he violated Mr. Floyd's civil rights. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and there were marches all over the country. All over the world. With, with, here, the, all over the world. But of all people, not, I mean, this was a genuine coalition of African-Americans, white folks, Latinos, 
Asians, I mean, really, all together, peacefully saying, we together need to end it. You know, Derek Chauvin did it. He pleaded guilty because he knew he violated the civil rights. And you have to have this balance. You're absolutely right about that. And that they've converted that powerful story of how do we find justice and, you know, putting, look at bad officers away for committing crimes is not inconsistent with saying, look, we want good policemen and we want good policing. And as you said, the uh, President Biden, Governor Evers have put money on the table to allow communities to hire police. And the, you know, the lies that have been told or something else, you know, maybe you can touch on uh, something that, you know, that we see a lot about the, you know, the border immigration DACA, we have all these, you know, wonderful kids that have been brought to our country, you know, to, through no fault of their own, come in, grow up. The only country they know is this country and we can't get them green cards or a right to citizenship and let them work and pay taxes. Isn't that also sort of on the ballot? Yeah, that absolutely is. And, you know, I, I guess once upon a time there were Republicans that were really talking about some immigration reform. And I think the majority of Americans think that people uh, who have gotten that DACA status should be naturalized. For sure, that group, that just is a, a layup, to put it in sports term. But um, uh, the we need more immigration lawyers, I think is absolutely uh, the case that people have the right to seek asylum in the United States. That is the law. So we need enough resources at the border to be able to separate the, you know, the weak from the shaft, and if they're criminals, don't let we 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 need to stand up that uh, so that we can make those uh, examinations early on. And quiet as it's kept, you know our uh, our uh, congressional budget office and other sorts of analyses of comprehensive immigration reform really demonstrates that you know with. Uh, with outlays and expenses and with collecting FICA and so forth, it, it, in probably over a decade, it, comprehensive immigration reform would, might bring in a trillion dollars, close to it. Well, now, right, and, and it's, kept, it's an economic benefit. Getting people out of the shadows, working, collecting that FICA. I'm a senior. I want them to collect that FICA when they have these hard um, Hispanic folks working you know, they need to be putting FICA in as, as a member. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the, I mean, everybody, what we don't also talk about, it. we would not have a dairy industry in this state if it wasn't for Latinos working on our farms. You know, right. it, it, it's just amazing, right? I mean, we can't function. Congresswoman Gwen Moore, I've got 40 seconds. So I'm going to give you 20 seconds to wrap it up. What do you got to say to people coming into this election? Believe. Just have faith. Just keep the faith, baby. Listen to our ancestors. As a keep the faith, you know, uh, uh, keep hope alive. You know, use your power. Vote. It's a power thing. Just go vote. And remember. Everybody, you hear that? Lately. Go vote. This is Attorney Mark Thompson, this is the Paul Revere Show. We'll be back. Congresswoman. Purchase your Thank you. Today. All right. Thank you so much.